I'm happy to be here and uh, to, to start uh, this uh, workshop. Um, in a way, this presentation, we're going to continue uh, some of the discussions that we just had uh, uh, previously today, and uh, I hope we're going to uh, further a bit uh, some of the questions that were already asked here. So, um, the title there, I think, is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the logic behind uh, those mobile borders uh, that we are seeing put into place today. So uh, I'm looking at technological determinism uh, in particular uh, and the shaping of those mobile borders, right? Um, I'm doing this in order to kind of um, draw attention to the logic that it's at the base of the incorporation of the digital technology into border making, right? Because this is generating those essential transformations that we spoke this morning here about in the nature of, uh, of state borders. And I want to start with something that, again, might get to some of the, some of the questions uh, this morning, the geographical imagination and how have we come to see borders uh, in the first place as territorial lines that surround uh, uh, areas, right, that surround territories. So this modern political territorial organization that we have of the world has been built on the Cartesian uh, view that sees space in absolute terms as a quantifiable object, right, um, that uh, can be broken into uh, neatly delineated pieces and, and then we could run statistics of it and we could measure it and we could see lengths and widths and, and all kinds of measurements, right? And then, of course, render it uh, knowable in a very scientific way, so to speak, right? So in practice, what this has meant is that meant that once we had this uh, theoretical idea of what space is, we have proceeded to divide the, the globe into mutually exclusive territorial units. Uh, which are our states today. Right. Well, one of the most consequential outcomes uh, of this pervasive mode of organization, it is that we have become accustomed to relate to space in those binary ways. I'm either here or there. It's, uh, it's either or. And that makes perfect sense when we look at Cartesianism, but of course, uh, as we're gonna see a bit later, uh, it doesn't make so much sense when we are thinking in, uh, in terms of flows and, uh, and other spatial configurations. So, with globalization, there is a changing geographical imagination now that incorporates a more polyvalent perspective, uh, which acknowledges the relational nature of space as opposed to this binary nature of space, right? Such perspective is more in tune with the mobile notion of space, defined by flows, hubs, connections, right? which is qualitatively different from the notion of space defined by territorial proximity and uh, distance decay, which is this uh, space that, we, uh, that Cartesianism has taught us to. So I think, uh, and I hope this gets a bit to David's questions earlier about uh, uh, what is it, uh, how is it that people are still perceiving uh, we are trying uh, this the space in, uh, in Cartesian ways, in, uh, in, in territorial ways. We are trying so hard to speak about flows, but many of us, most of us, most of the people in the world have no mental maps of how else can actually the world look like when it is depicted in terms of flows. And for good reason, they don't have a good idea because it's, uh, it's very difficult to imagine uh, something like that. Uh, although I claim that if you look at the Portland maps, for example, or Marseille didn't appear as part of France, but as part of this network of, uh, of Mediterranean ports, I, I think we could find starting points uh, uh, even uh, before uh, this modern era, right? But accordingly, so, accordingly, uh, speaking of this change in, uh, in geographical imagination, we are witnessing the emergence of complementary forms of state borders, and I want to stress a lot the word complementary because Again, we, we try very hard to avoid this dichotomy that we are changing totally from one mode of organization to another, right? From territories to networks and flows. That's absolutely not true. Unfortunately, it's more complex than that, and we, we're going to have both territories and flows. So this mode of uh, this geographical imagination, it's complementary, right? Uh, those borders are complementary to, to the norms of this territorial linearity uh, that, that we are used with. And what's happening here is that those borders are becoming embedded in the flows, right? So that they can travel with the flows. They, they, they can be in this movement, right? And uh, also that means that we could continually monitor them across space. Or at least that's what, uh, uh, what the powers that we want to achieve. We're going to see a bit later 
if that's uh, what's actually achieved and what's not. So now I want to uh, jump a bit here, scales, to something else, something I call technological imagination, right? So with advances in, uh, advances, I'm sorry, in uh, digital technology, there is the belief that social life as well can be put uh, into, into a digitally knowable form. Right? And what I'm trying to say here is that um, we already know that uh, we could, uh, you know, we, got, we, we have sequenced the DNA, we could uh, read emotions. Hey, uh, a few uh, months ago we have even seen uh, objects moved with the power of the mind, right? Uh, neuroscient neuroscientists actually have achieved that. So the idea is that this technological imagination today, right, um, see those developments uh, uh, in, a, in a very almost superhuman way. And I'm, I'm taking a lot of care of saying that, but I own it. Right? I, I, I claim that that's pretty much how we are looking at those, simply because they are so far advanced to what we used to know to be possible even a few years ago. I mean, if you look only at how uh, the iPhones have evolved, I think uh, that says it all, right? So um, then what this means when we look at this, those advances in technology with those um, eyes that it's, uh, it's more than we humans could actually understand, then of course uh, it becomes very hard to, to dig, right, to scratch around, I mean, uh, under the surface and to see what's exactly the technology that makes this possible, right? So we tend to take them for granted then as societies, as, well, if the computer tells me it is like that, then who am I to fight with a computer? Computer is smarter than me, and, and therefore it must be real. And this is a pervasive sense in many institutions, right, in, in people and so on. So then accordingly, the shaping of those mobile borders, it's heavy influenced by a series of digital technologies. I'm going to refer here uh, only to biometrics and RFID, but there's much more than that, that are assumed to have predictive powers and are generally conceptualized in terms of this unfaltering uh, efficiency and also panacea, right? Something that solves all your problems that you had before in securitizing transnational mobility. So then it's interesting to go ahead and take a look to see what exactly is the outcome uh, uh, of those uh, geographical and technological imaginations on um, the evolution of borders, right? And we are seeing here a paradigmatic shift, really, from uh, governments and, and, uh, and decision-making factors trying to secure those territories that were the nation states, and therefore by securing the territory, you secure the national group that was inside those territories, right? To now securing the flow that goes in and out and through those national territories, right? So the national territory does not disappear. Something else happened with it, which is very interesting. I'm going to get to it a bit later. So when we think of mobility in terms of flows, the individual becomes uh, pretty much geographically atomized. And I'm not speaking here only human bodies, but even our shoeboxes have RFID in them, and uh, our customs officials will, will tell us that, right? They, you could track their movements in, a, in a shipping chains and so on. So then to secure the flow means, by default, to control every single one of its components. If you don't do that, if you miss one, then you didn't control the flow, right? So it's a very high bar, high task to set for yourself to be able to monitor everything inside the flow in order to then gain that total awareness of the, of the flow, right, of the movements of the flow. So in this logic, risks have to be extracted or, or guessed or uh, the metaphor fishing, it's also used, right, you have to fish for the risk from this continuous flow of uh, objects, people, ideas, right, uh, that, that we have. So then surveillance activities, right, uh, have to be scrutinized uh, along the entire journey in order to achieve a successful uh, or a useful uh, uh, monitoring of the flow. So we are seeing already here a very different conceptualization of space, right? We are, we are seeing a space that it's actually suddenly possible to be monitorized, to be controlled, to be envisioned as a flow, as a moving target, as a moving object, as opposed to this area here and this area here and then surveying the areas only, right? We are, we are totally qualitatively changing the way we see space when we look at it in this way, right? So in practice, this enables the emergence of a global regime of uh, technologically assist continuous filtration 
which is what we need to do with those flows, right? In order to allow our lives to go on, we still need to move, but we need to be supervised somehow, to be regulated somehow. And those territorial lines, since they can't do very well this regulation of the flow, then of course this fishing inside the flow, we're going to do the job, right? So selective mobility seems to be the name of the game, and this idea of filtration, of continuous monitorization in order then to purge to exclude the unwanted elements inside this flow. So, I'm arriving here of, uh, of one of my favorite, one of, among many, one of my favorite images, and I, I, want you, I want you to be with me here, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep this for a few minutes. This is the automatic border, right? This is what we are wanting to achieve. This is what we are striving to, and as you see, it's not only striving, because it exists. This is a picture taken in Finland, if I'm not wrong, the Finnish airport. Um, so, if you look at that, I, uh, since we are speaking a lot about arts here, um, I want you to imagine a few things, but before that I want to add, to throw one more thing at you here. is this idea of a uh, uh, global entry, right, of this automatic pass that actually makes it possible to go flawless through those border gates, right? So, this idea of a um, trusted trusted traveler program started very small, right? Only people who are traveling very much were, uh, were invited to, to be part of those pre-screened, pre-cleared -pre right, uh, uh, movement rights. However, uh, lately, I don't know much yet in Europe, but in the US, uh, uh, they advertise this on TV. Suddenly, they thought that uh, uh, selected travelers or global travelers is not enough, and it's actually going to be a good idea if you could enroll a majority of the population in those programs, because then what you have just achieved, if you do that, of course, you just achieve this pre-bordering of everybody, right? So with those two images in mind, I want you to imagine now that you all have this border clearance, right? So, where's the border? Now, if you could go flawlessly through the airport, to the, this is happening also to the terrestrial borders, it's not only in the airports, right? Where is the, where are you bordered? And, and it's becoming very interesting now, right? Because, in fact, you are bordered right there. The, 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 function of the border, right, the checking, the regulation is happening there too, but that's really not where the emphasis is now. The emphasis is when you get that global entry pass. The emphasis is when you're going to register whatever office inside your own hometown or wherever you go to, to register your biometrics into the database. But wait a minute, because it's not only the biometrics that we are speaking here about. In order to get one of those, they have to run a security check on you to see who you associate with, right? Who knows that security services are gonna tell you what they are actually looking for to give you a pre-clearance. So then, when you are starting to look at borders in this way, right, you suddenly start to realize that the border has way, has already, right, for quite a while, has been pushed inside the society, right? It's not anymore there at a one-stop shop border, right, where you used to do the custom, the checking, the police, verify your identity and so on. Now you are bordered along your journey, right? And this is, there's a parallel system for goods as well, but I'm, I can't speak here about all of them, right? So let, let's stick with people now, for now. And there's another uh, question that comes to my mind here, another huge one, right? Another one that makes a, a, a big difference. It's, um, well, what are we to make then of those fences that are put up uh, around the world since we kind of see clearly here how the border, right, it's, uh, uh, it's embedded in the flow. How do we explain fences? It's almost unexplainable, right? Where is this desire to build, uh, uh, to put uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, firepower on the border and barbed wires and so on? And uh, that, that's, that's another question to ponder, right? What's becoming of the fence when you are actually organizing I travel through space in this mobile way. And, uh, you know, there has been a lot of pushback from uh, many, not only in uh, geography, but in other uh, uh, social sciences, as well as uh, more exact sciences, like natural sciences, to kind of see this idea of the fortress Europe and fortress this and that as a, uh, instead of seeing it as a metaphor to take it for its face value. But uh, I think we could see here as well that once we are thinking of borders, uh, in this way, then the territorial border that we all know, the one that has the fence on it, the fence is really just for the showmanship there, for show off, right? It does not really perform the function of stopping, controlling, checking one stop shop border anymore. The fence is embedded into this, 
right? It has become that territorial line has not lost its spatiality. Territories still help us to understand borders, right? It's just that it's a different notion of territory, right? A more topological uh, notion of territory, right? That has less to do with this topographical territory, but it's still territory. It's just qualitatively different. And I think this, uh, uh, this makes a big difference, again, trying to conceptualize where is the change. We speak a lot about flows and so on, but how exactly are they working? And I think those two questions get at least partially offer us a, a starting point to kind of think of what factually is changing, right? So then I want to take you inside this a bit, right? Uh, to see what's happening, what it is there that it's actually monitored. What are those pieces? Right, the little parts of the flow that has to be monitored, right? So the body has emerged, again, along with the shoeboxes and uh, water cans and so on. The body has emerged as one of the, the primordial um, uh, uh, components of the flow, right? And for good reason, if you think about our bodies, right, this is the smallest space there is until you go to, or unless you go to metaphysics, right? And uh, it's ready to be performed because you already have it with you. <laughs> it would be hard to do it otherwise. Uh, so those embodied, embodied borders are, are uh, very much, uh, you know, make sense a lot in order to control flows. So then the use of biometrics is predicated on this need to verify a person's identity to confirm that they are who they say they are. Now, underlining their appeal is this assumption that the person's identity makes a good risk predictor for the society, right? So then at the border, we already saw in Emmanuel's presentation the metaphor of the, of the password, right? The, the body works pretty much as a password, right? A person's identity will be digitally read from their body part, right? Uh, whichever that might be. And checked against the data stored in the databases or on passport chips. And that will verify your identity. And there you go. I'm going to differentiate between the terrorist and the good guy. And uh, the rest is history, right? Well, there we go. This is another of my uh, billion dollar slides, right? Uh, and I, I want you to take a good, hard look at it. Uh, what's written there, it's written, no hit found, right? And that's pretty much how you, as Mary and Jane, right, uh, emerge out of those border systems. So it's a pass on a go. Whatever happens behind that screen, right, uh, this idea of a body as a passport, that's what it comes to, right? If it is a hit, uh, of course, you don't pass. If it isn't, you are the flow is free to go. Well, but what does it mean to be a hit? A hit of what, right? And I hope this gets a bit to the question of who, who borders and what for, right? So I want to take you in, inside or behind that screen a bit because we are having another way now, another avenue to understand how uh, this technologically deterministic understanding of technology, right? Or the te deterministic understanding of technology shapes borders. So. This body as the password logic really uh, reflects a strain of technological determinism that misses the fact that identifying a body is not the same as knowing who I am, right? You're going to know my body. Yes, you will, probably, because that's not tamper-proof either, but I don't want us to get into that now. So in order to verify somebody's identity, you have to actually determine, right? Determine as opposed to verify. So you have to make those technological systems to say that I am Gabriel and I think like this and like that and I'm going to do this and that. Now, isn't this great, right? So how are you going to make the bytes, the zeros and the ones, to tell you what I'm going to do, right? So this is where the database, and that's what I wanted to, to get when I, I'm sorry, right? The, the idea behind the screen there, the database emerges as the corner store of the system. Of course you can, by my biometrics, I'm not gonna tell you who I am, right? So then you need those databases, and here is where Edward Snowden's story, right, comes right up to you and, and is breaking open uh, in, the, in the sun, right, or under the sunshine. So those databases have to contain additional information in order then for other humans to write a mathematical algorithm to say that the coffee that I drank this morning will gonna tell you what I'm gonna do next day or not, or who knows what kind of books I read. The idea is that for those algorithms to even statistically come close to telling something about me, right, you're gonna have to have a lot of data about what I'm doing daily, right? A lot of them, because if you just know my coffee, really what are the chances you're gonna know 
what kind of risk I am, right? So then you're going to have to electronically mine them, right? Like those crawlers that you see on the internet today. You're going to have to mine my daily life uh, in order to find for some patterns of association to see if I'm the good or the bad guy. Which good or bad? Thank you. Uh, of course, uh, it's a relative question. So this is what, right? Uh, this brings us to that the implied behind this logic of how do we implement technologies into bordering practices is this promise that somehow the technology are going to predict uh, our behavior and of course uh, stay away from predicting stuff, right? So while not being able to say who you actually really are, automated border technologies are in fact producing one side, one's identity um, to say who they have to be, right? Instead of verifying that you are who you say you are, which is a classic phrase, right? The purpose of change, uh, change is to say that you are who we say you are. You are who the database tells us you are, right? So then the end product is a computer-generated identity that nobody really understands how have you arrived to my characterization, to my identity like that. Nonetheless, you have to trust it because you don't argue with a computer. So this is not the identity of a person as a social being, but the identity of an object, right? Uh, following a bit Foucault here, that has been rendered knowable. So to have a bit of fun, right? This is kind of what the computer tells you. Dear sir or madam, right? Here's who you are. I read it from your irises, palm, finger, facial geometry, whatever, you name it. It was an erroneous understanding of the relationship between what technology is and how society uses it. Over-reliance, and that's what I stress there, right? Over-reliance on technology promotes a view of border management as a technical problem only that requires a technical fix. And then in this, it misconstructing the border subject as a material object that could be actually known by binary code, right? So digital technology, just because it uses the binary code, it is not bias-free just because we don't understand how computers arrive at decision, that doesn't mean that somebody doesn't write those algorithms there. So then those cultural stereotypes that we had them in pre-digital world, they are still there in the computer. It's just that it's becoming more difficult for us to, to see them. And finally, those border technologies cannot help predict the future. That's pretty much to, to know what, how one's mind work, and that's still far away. So instead, what they end up doing is they end up to create the future. And evidence show that such a technologically deterministic future right, reduces life to simple mechanics. And then, of course, uh, our political democratic control over border uh, uh, changes dramatically in this, uh, uh, in this context.